So good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to the Beginner's Guide to OMS session. My name is Jonathan White. Um, I'm a medical doctor specialising in obstetrics and gynaecology uh, from Belfast, Northern Ireland. And a little bit about me and my MS story. I was diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS just over two years ago, following an episode of optic neuritis and uh, transverse myelitis, or buzzing like mobile phones down both legs. Um, and when I was diagnosed, my medical brain went into overdrive and I thought, where's the evidence? What can we do? There must be more to this than just taking a tablet and sitting back and, and allowing things to take its course or not doing anything in some cases. And very quickly, my research led me to Professor Jelinek and the OMS program. And ever since then, so just over two years, I've been a very passionate follower, um, believer, and hopefully a successful advocate for the program. My job today is to tell you a little bit about what MS is as a disease, because if, if you are truly beginning your journey, a lot of the time in the NHS there's not time to tell you. And that's, that's wrong, but unfortunately that's the way it is sometimes. So I'm going to try and explain to you for about 15 minutes just exactly what MS is at the very basic level. And then I'm going to talk you through the seven steps. And you can see them here. Every presenter has this slide to show where we are in our journey. And I'm going to try and cover them all for you. Not in massive detail, that's what each session will be for, but I will hopefully give you some information about everything to do with the programme. So what is multiple sclerosis? Well, multiple in medical terms, as in real life, means just more than one site in the body. Sclerosis means scarring, thickening, or hardening. And that's not specific to the nervous system, which is where it happens in MS, but for example, in the heart, atherosclerosis, that's just thickening or scarring in the arteries of the heart. So it's not a specific term. It's a disease of the brain and the spinal cord. Those two things together constitute what we call the central nervous system. So brain and spinal cord is the central nervous system. From leaving the spinal cord down your arms, your legs, it's a peripheral nervous system, and that's not affected by multiple sclerosis. We know that it is the most common disabling neurological con condition of young adults, and that most people are diagnosed in their 20s and their 30s. It is three times more common in women than men, and currently there is no cure. But what everybody is here, bye bye Angus, what everybody is here to tell you today is that recovery is possible. I need to tell you a little bit about epidemiology of MS. That's just a fancy medical word for a study of how often diseases happen in certain populations and why they do. With MS, it was first recognised in the mid-1800s in France. Um, a gentleman called Jean-Martin Charcot, who was a French pathologist and neurologist, had a patient who had very strange symptoms of uh, blurred vision, strange eye movements, tremor, speech problems, and he had no idea what she had. Everybody thought back then everybody had syphilis, so she was treated with gold and strychnine and silver and all sorts of things. And she died some years later and he performed her autopsy and he found in her brain and spinal cord what's called sclerose on plaque. And pardon my French, but um, that is the first time in medical literature that uh, medic uh, the multiple sclerosis was seen. We know that approximately one in 600 people in the United Kingdom, so that's 100,000 people, have the disease. And around the world, there are 2.5 million. So on average, one in a thousand people will suffer from MS around the world. The further you move north or south towards the poles from the equator, the rate of the disease increases. And we also know that it's becoming more common. We think that that is likely due to increasingly unhealthy lifestyles or the Western diet. And I'm going to tell you a lot more about that. To understand MS, you really have to understand the building blocks of the nervous system. And that's this little fellow here, and that's a neuron, a nerve cell. The blue is the cell body, and those little dendrites, or fingers, are receiving information from the cells around it. If it's, a, if it's a pathway, it's getting information from here and here and here, and it's sending it to the nucleus, which is the control center, the hub of the cell. And it, it decides then what to send on and, and what to process. And it does that down the axon, which is the blue. Um, and if you think of that like a railway line, for a train to go down a railway line smoothly and efficiently, the lines have to be greased or oiled to protect them and to allow smooth passage. And that's what the myelin sheath does. This is a fatty layer wrapped around the axon that speeds up the transmission of nerve cell impulses down a cell um, and ensures that they're uh, propagated correctly. And it's the myelin sheath that's attacked by the body in multiple sclerosis. And that's where all the symptoms arise initially. There's a horrible word on that slide, which is immunology. When I was a medical student, I didn't understand anything to do with immunology. It is so unbelievably complicated. But there are two things that we need to know about MS and immunology, and I'm just going to talk very briefly about that. 
One is something called the blood-brain barrier. If you think of it like passport control, and I don't want to talk about Brexit and all those sorts of things, but <laughs> basically the blood-brain barrier is a highly selective membrane that lines the blood vessels inside the brain. So as blood is being pumped from the heart up through the head and through the brain, this barrier is like passport control, and it decides who gets through into the brain tissue, so glucose and things that it needs to work properly, oxygen, and what to send back through, so waste products from the brain. So it's designed to stop things that would potentially be toxic from getting in anywhere near the brain. And that includes white blood cells. Funnily enough, white blood cells have no place outside of the blood system inside the brain. They shouldn't be in brain tissue. And obviously we know they, they are in MS. And we think that's because the barrier becomes leaky. We're not entirely sure why, but it starts to leak. So you've got the wrong passport, but you still get through the gate. That's what happens. The other concept is the Th1 and Th2 immune response, which Phil alluded to earlier in his talk. If you think of it like a seesaw, it's not that one is bad and one is good because you need both of them. Th1 is predominantly inflammation. If you have the flu or you cut your arm, you need your immune system to recognize that, to send the troops in and to fix it, to heal you. Th2 is the other side, that's the repair and, uh, and turn off anti-inflammatory signals. So the balance is constantly changing, but in MS we know that the balance has unfortunately shifted very predominantly towards inflammation. So what happens then in MS? Well, it's an inflammatory demyelinating, which means removal of myelin, so it's stripping the myelin off the nerve cell, condition of the central nervous system, as we talked about. So immune cells get across the barrier when they shouldn't. The immune system has already been primed for whatever reason, there are many theories about this, against myelin. So it gets into the brain and it says, there's myelin and that's a foreign invader and I'm going to attack it. It damages the myelin and because of that, then the nerve impulses are slowed or they're distorted, hence the buzzing or tingling, for example, or it's not transmitted at all. The nerve just stops firing. After that initial episode of inflammation, you get scarring. So there's damage around where the myelin is gone. The body tries to heal that with scar tissue, the same way when you cut yourself. And in the early stages of the disease, you will get some remyelination. So there will be little cells called oligodendrocytes that can come along and it's like they're regreasing the tracks. They can build myelin around the damaged areas. But over time, that process gets worn down, if you like. And you actually, without myelin, it's like the tracks of the train rust. And that's how you get nerve fiber loss over time. So that's what you see here. So it's, unfortunately, it's not the same color, but it's the same thing. Um, and we've got damaged myelin along here and distorted messages as a result because the nerve cell can't work normally. So what causes this disease? Well, it's not really known, but we know that it's not one thing. It's very likely that it's multifactorial. Genetics undoubtedly will play a part. We know that uh, in medicine, we love studying identical twins because if something is purely genetic, if one twin has it, then 100% of the time the other twin will get it because they share the same DNA. So if it's a purely genetic condition, they both get it. In MS, only a quarter, 25% of the time, does that happen. So it's, we know that it can't be purely in your genes. So that means 75% of your risk comes from somewhere else. Infection is something that's often uh, postulated as perhaps a reason for it, but no single pathogen, virus, bacteria, has ever been identified. That said, there's an increasing theory that Epstein-Barr virus, which causes glandular fever, may be a cause. It has to be something that once you get over the initial attack, it can lie dormant inside the body. An Epstein-Barr virus would be an example of that, where the body clears the infection, but there's still some of that virus left around in the system. And we know that your chances of MS are significantly higher if you've been exposed to EBV, but then it's very common in the population, so it's, it's quite difficult to prove, and there's still a lot of work going on there. But infection may be a cause. Environment is definitely linked. The incidence we know is lowest at the equator, and if you live in a low-risk area of MS until the age of 15, so say you live around the tropics, and then, I don't know why you would ever do this, but you move to the Arctic <laughs> at, on your 16th birthday, your risk, even if you don't see daylight for the next six months, will remain exactly the same. Your risk won't change, even if you move to a high-risk area, if you were there in the low-risk area until you were 15. So something happens, something is programmed in those years of childhood. And likewise in reverse, if you are in a high risk area and you move to a low risk area, so you get out of the Arctic, you move to the tropics, your risk is still high. So something happens, but we don't know quite what. The other thing to say is that there's some ethnic groups, the Inuits, 
who don't see any sunlight for six months of the year. They have an incredibly low incidence of MS, and you think that they would have a very high incidence if you relate to vitamin D, which I'm about to talk about, into it. But we think because they eat so much oily fish, which has got vitamin D and omega-3 in it, that that's protective for them. And I'm going to talk about both those things later. Vitamin D itself, we know that low levels are associated with increased risk of contracting the disease or suffering from MS and of the disease progressing. And we also know that vitamin D is crucial, apart from the sunlight hormone that everyone has maybe heard of, it's very, very important in regulating how your immune system works, and we think that's how it's connected to MS. Then there's also a vascular theory, and I've only, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I do want to tell you about it because there's a lot of press about it. There's an Italian scientist whose wife had MS. He thought there was a theory to do with chronic cerebrospinal venous insufficiency, I'm not saying that again, CCSVI, where the blood vessels at the back of the brain, draining the brain back to the heart, became narrowed, and if you stood on a hose, the pressure builds up behind it. In the same way, that back pressure inside the brain, he thought, could spark uh, the inflammatory cascade of MS. And his initial results were very positive, and it seemed this was potentially a miracle cure. Unfortunately, they replicated his study without him in America, and the results were nowhere near as positive. So, unfortunately, that has largely been disproved. The symptoms of MS are incredibly variable. If there are 60 people in this room, there, will, there could be 60 stories about MS and none of them would be the same. But there are some common features that do go along with the disease. Very common things that people often have early on. Numbness and tingling, so distortion of those nerve signals will, can cause numbness and tingling. Hands and feet, face perhaps. Visual problems, optic neuritis is a disease in its own right, but a very common presenting feature of MS, as in my case. Um, Early on, people often describe muscle spasms and fatigue. Fatigue is, is everywhere in MS, unfortunately. And the way I describe it to people is that it's like having a hangover, jet lag, and the flu at the same time. <laughs> and people go, oh, that must be dreadful. And because I have a real bugbear about people saying, you must be very tired all the time when you've got MS. I, I, I don't like hearing that. But when you explain it in those terms, I think it maybe helps to people to understand. Pain, um, not just aches and, and general musculoskeletal problems, but actually nerve damage, neuropathic pain is a big problem. Bowel and bladder symptoms, very common incontinence or urgency, frequency. Um, cognitive dysfunction, I would argue that it's much higher than 13% if, depending on the testing you do. And that can be in uh, memory, problem solving, recall. You maybe have had experience yourself where you just can't remember a name and you think, is that because of MS or is that because I'm tired or whatever? And they're generally subtle changes. It's not like Alzheimer's dementia, uh, which has a global effect on your intellect. Your intelligence remains the same nearly always, but it can have subtle difficulties. And it's very variable with, with, uh, associated with your fatigue. Everybody, I think, who's heard of MS will associate it with walking difficulty. We know that the majority will not use a wheelchair uh, permanently, um, but approximately half of people will have difficulty with walking. There's something on that um, board, which, or something that is not on that board, that I want to very briefly mention, which is sexual problems in, in MS. There's a recent study that said of people who were sexually active, only 12% had a normal sex life following a diagnosis of MS. And that's something which needs to be talked about more and is, is currently very rarely talked about. Um, so, Types of MS. I'm not going to go into huge detail about this, but I, I want to leave you with a few snippets about it. Relapsing, remitting MS, uh, I have another slide on, is subdivided into rapidly evolving, severe, relapsing, remitting MS, benign MS, and clinically isolated syndrome. Clinically isolated syndrome is when you have a first episode of neurological symptoms lasting over 24 hours. And depending on what your MRI shows at that point, you have between a 30 to 70% chance of developing MS within the next 15 years. Secondary progressive MS will affect between 30 and 66, two-thirds percent of patients with relapsing remitting initially after 25 years, and that was traditionally the point at which uh, medical therapies were stopped. Primary progressive MS, as Phil was talking about, 10 to 15 percent of patients are diagnosed with this, and it, in this form of the disease, you have progressive disability from the outset, and previously there were, there were no treatments for that, but uh, in the very near future, we, we really hope that there will be within the next year. And then relapsing progressive MS, which is um, the rarest type, 5% uh, of patients uh, suffer from this, where you have relapses, but you also develop disability quite early on in the, in the disease. 
So just a little bit more about relapsing remitting because it is so common. So 65 to 70% of patients at the outset. It's characterized by having these symptomatic episodes and then partial or complete recovery in between. But that's very misleading because if you think, well, I don't have any symptoms, so my MS mustn't be active. If you think of it like an iceberg, uh, what you see above the sea is a relapse, but there's a lot happening underneath the water. We know that it takes on average 10 lesions in your brain or cord for one relapse. Um, so you can have very active disease, but you may not know it. And, and that's why MRI developing as rapidly as it has, has really changed how MS is monitored. A relapse is the appearance of new symptoms that, or worsening of old symptoms that last over 24 hours. But in the early stages of the disease, that can be very difficult to tell. Uh, when symptoms fluctuate day by day, hour by hour anyway, uh, it can be very difficult to know what's just a bad day versus a new relapse. The frequency of relapses and the severity of them are incredibly unpredictable from one person to the next to, to get very greatly. But on average, they're one to two a year. We know that medical therapies have advanced hugely over the last 15 years and are becoming better and better, and they can reduce relapse frequency uh, quite significantly in some cases, and now there is evidence that they can slow disease progression. And just a very um, quick word about benign MS. The wizard with the magic crystal ball is because you can't diagnose benign MS looking forward. Everybody would love to be told, you're going to have benign MS, don't worry. That's 10 to 15% of patients, but actually, you can only be told you have it after you've had 10 years of the disease where you've had very little in the way of relapses and very little in the way of disability. Actually, though, if you were to tighten the criteria, the EDSS, the scoring system for disability, and you take out to 15 years rather than 10, the true incidence is probably only 6%. And it's a really terrible term to say benign because that sounds friendly and not very serious. About 45% of patients with benign MS will have cognitive symptoms, and that may be the only thing that they ever suffer. But that can have huge, that's a huge disability, potentially, to people, and, it's, uh, and it really is an invisible one. So what's the impact of the disease? Well, the cost of MS to the UK economy is incredibly hard to estimate, but it's thought to be £4.2 billion pounds annually. Employment status varies hugely, and that's dependent on your educational levels before you get the disease, uh, your, the type of job that you do, uh, the support network from your colleagues and employers, and these sorts of things. But we know that early retirement affects up to a quarter of MS patients in Europe. And on average, having MS will result in a loss of 10 working years. 50% of patients with MS suffer at least one episode of clinical depression. I didn't mention that in the last slide because the number was so low. I borrowed that slide from another society. But the true fact is that half of all people with MS will suffer an episode of depression. And it's not just because it's a difficult disease to deal with and all the social and, and those aspects. The disease itself, physically damaging parts of the brain that control mood, can actually cause clinical depression, the lesions themselves. And we know that depression and MS it's, it's higher than any other chronic disease. It's the most common. It impacts your whole family. It, you don't need me to tell you that it's partners, friends, children, other loved ones, work colleagues. Everybody is affected by a diagnosis of MS. And most people are diagnosed at a time in their lives when they're trying to make very major life decisions. What job will I embark on? Should I go to university? Will I get married? Will I go off and travel the world for two years? Should I start a family? Difficult, life-changing decisions. But there are a lot of myths that go around with MS, and I want to bust a few of those for you. Despite what insurance companies will tell you, MS is not a terminal illness. It reduces your life expectancy slightly, on average by six years, but that was done at a time when there were very little treatments. So now, with treatment, it's probably less than that. We don't know the, the real number, but it's, to put it in perspective, diabetes takes, on average, 10 years off your life expectancy, so it's less. The majority, as I said, will not use a wheelchair regularly, you should not reduce your level of physical activity just because you have MS. Um, doctors were very good at telling you you should. Don't be doing too much exercise. It raises your heart rate, your blood pressure, your temperature. It'll make your symptoms worse. With all due respect to them, that's nonsense. It may make your symptoms slightly worse, but there are, there are many ways around that, um, and there are sessions today to tell you about that. And there's something that almost anybody can do exercise-wise, no matter what your level of disability. You won't necessarily have to stop working. And something that's particularly interesting to me as an obstetrician is that it has no effect on pregnancy outcome. It doesn't increase your risk of miscarriage, of infertility, of stillbirth, of caesarean sections, of bleeding more. N none of that is affected. 
And in fact, being pregnant is protective. While you're pregnant, your immune system is turned down because it can't attack the baby. Uh, and during that time, you often find a reduced relapse rate. The one thing to warn you, though, is unfortunately, after pregnancy, the immune system tends to turn up again. And so some people will, unfortunately, suffer a relapse at that point. Another thing I think is incredibly important to say, in the UK especially, is breastfeeding protects the mother. It reduces her risk of MS by 50%. And for those of us with MS who want to protect our children, breastfeeding a baby for six months exclusively reduces their risk of MS by 50-50%. It's free, and if, if you can do it, it's incredibly protective. So let's move on to the seven-step program. I've done this in a circle because I want to show you that it is not step one goes to step two to three to four. All of those work together. No one is more important than the other and they all fit together. But step one is the one that people usually have heard of when they come to look at Professor Jelinek's work. And that's diet, that's the cornerstone of the program. The evidence comes from a study that lasted 34 years by Dr. Roy Swank in America. And it was published in the 90s in a major medical journal called The Lancet. But unfortunately, doctors have almost completely ignored it. The results were incredible. They had 150 patients, 75 followed a very low saturated fat diet, under 16 grams a day, 75 did not. They found in the low fat diet group, they had significantly reduced disability accumulation and disease progression over the course of the study, and that relapse rates were lower by 80% after 12 months, and 95% lower at five years of following the diet. The reason why doctors have said, that's nonsense, because uh, to me that sounds very impressive, but the reason that they say it's nonsense is because Dr. Swank was a victim of his own success. His study went on for so long that when he started, there was no guidance on what evidence-based medicine should be. By the time he finished, the sharks were in the water, if you like, and the criticism is that there was investigative bias, which means that the people taking the results knew which group the patients were in before they did it. And if you knew what group a patient is, you could technically be biased against it. you say, well, I want to show this is rubbish, so I'm going to score them harder. But to counter that, what they were actually recording was pretty objective. Are they able, fit and able, walking, working? Are they in a chair? Are they bed bound? Or are they dead? It's, there's not a huge amount of bias can be involved in that. Obviously, I, that's ironic because I am biased towards it. But that, to put it into perspective, you know, and they also say, well, it wasn't a randomized control trial. How can you randomize somebody with a diet? They're going to know what they're eating. You know, a steak doesn't look like a salad, <laughs> with all due respect. Um, but nonetheless, that's where it came from. And that study has been replicated many times with very similar results, and indeed by Professor Janak himself recently. So just to give you a, a, why fats, why does it matter? So fats and oils, as we think of, are both actually fatty acids. Fatty acids are chains of carbon atoms linked to hydrogen atoms, okay, along there. Saturated fats are solid at room temperature, so that's butters and cheeses, and they come mainly from animals. And they're saturated because the little bonds between the carbons are all single bonds. They tend to be very rigid, very inflexible, quite pro-inflammatory, not easily incorporated into the body. On the other hand, polyunsaturated fats, poly just meaning many, and unsaturated means double bonds, fatty acids are omega-3, omega-6, omega-9, which you may have heard of. These are liquids at room temperature, and they come mainly from plants and seafood. Our cell membranes, the little bags that hold all the important stuff inside a cell, are two layers of fats. Okay, so the envelope is fat around, your around the cell. When you take a mainly polyunsaturated fat diet, and you are what you eat, it gets incorporated into your cells. The membranes become soft, flexible, they're squishy, they're less sticky, so things, immune signals don't stick to them as easily, so they're not as reactive. They resist degeneration and they don't spark inflammation around the body, whereas saturated fats are an inflammation magnet to the body. And apart from that, the actual compounds in the fatty acids are turned into signals, little messengers for the immune system to send around the body. And omega-3, um, which we may have heard of, and I'll be talking about later, is very anti-inflammatory. It tells the immune system, settle down, there's no threat here, keep calm, we don't need to attack anything. Omega-6, on the other hand, which is generally in sunflower oil, is quite pro-inflammatory, and it's a signal that says, whoa, there's, there's a threat here, we need to be on guard and ready to attack. 
The relevance of that as well is that a diet high in omega-3, if you put that in perspective and it's anti-inflammatory, shifts that seesaw that I talked about from Th1 to Th2. So, the holism study. This is Professor Jelinek's team in the University of Melbourne, neuroepidemiology unit. And they tried to essentially replicate Swank's original study, but uh, in the modern era, if you like. So they found that people who were meat and dairy free had a significantly better quality of life in terms of mental and physical health. Whenever I started the OMS diet, everybody said, do you not miss cheese? Do you not miss meat? Da, 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 da. And you must be miserable. Well, I'm not miserable at all, actually. I, I'm, I'm, I love what I eat, I always have. Um, and it's just different, but it's certainly no worse. In fact, it's much better. We found that daily flaxseed oil, which is very, very high in omega-3, reduced relapse rates by 60% on its own. Like, to put it into perspective, some medicines will reduce, good medicines reduce it by 50%. That would be a really acceptable number. And I will talk to you about flaxseed oil in a second. Eating fish three times weekly reduced your relapse rate by 50%. That's where the Inuit people perhaps fit into the story. And dairy. So buterophilin is a protein in cow's milk that under a microscope looks like myelin. So it resembles the structure of myelin, that fatty coat. So in people who are prone to inflammation uh, and already have this sort of the, the other factors that will eventually lead to MS, it can initiate an autoimmune response. And then, unfortunately, every time you're taking dairy products, you're taking something that the body recognizes as, hold on, that's a foreign invader and I need to attack it. Where is it? It's on my nerve cells. And th we think that's how it, it feels the cascade. Some good news, it's not all, you know, bad. Um, if you enjoy a tipple, uh, we find that moderate alcohol consumption, so that's 30 to 42 grams in a day, which is about three units, is associated with a better quality of life than people who drank nothing at all, or as you'd expect, people who drank too much. So moderate alcohol is okay. So OMS recommends a plant-based whole food diet plus seafood supplemented with 20 milliliters of flaxseed oil daily. Sunlight and vitamin D. So vitamin D, as I said, has a key function in immune regulation and in protecting the brain. And there's evidence, it's incredible when you look, for reduction in depression rates, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, and some cancers. And there's substantial, really substantial evidence for vitamin D in MS prevention and increasingly good, good evidence for reducing disease activity. 75% of MS cases could be prevented if your vitamin D level was over 100 nanomoles per litre, which is the unit we use in the UK. To put it into perspective, we think that probably 50% of the UK population is vitamin D deficient at some point during the year, obviously winter being higher than summer. And now the government advises that everybody, not MS patients, everybody should be on at least 400 units of vitamin D a day because we know that it's so prevalent. But if you keep your level over 100, your chances of developing MS will be reduced by 75%. Higher levels equals less lesions, less relapses, and less shrinkage of the brain or brain atrophy. <coughs> and if you increase your level by 50 nanomoles per litre, you can reduce your relapses and your disability, or sorry, and your lesion rate by 57%. We also know that having higher vitamin D levels in the long term can lead to less disability progression with time. It's made in the skin on exposure to the sun's UVB rays. And its primary function, what it's there for, is to absorb calcium, magnesium, and phosphate from your gut to your bile, which is essential for muscle and bone growth. So that's its primary function. So the skin can make 1,000 units a minute. Can I ask a question? Or you do? I'd love to be able to answer your question, but I have, I'm told I'm not allowed to until the end. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, but but come, and, come and find me if I can, because the timing's so tight. I know, I know there, I'm sure you will have burning questions. To a maximum of 15,000 units. Now, the thing to say is that's only if the UV index is seven or higher. And in perspective, the UK on a really good day is about four. And you have to be nearly naked in the sun to achieve that. <laughs> so that's maybe not uh, realistic. I wouldn't advise it. But so you say, well, I can't be naked in the sun and the sunlight's not very strong. So maybe if I uh, just have my arms and legs exposed for a longer time, will I get my units that way? The answer is no, because each part of the body has only a certain amount that it can make in any given time. So it doesn't quite work like that. 
the UV index decreases directly as you move away from the equator. So the sunlight, you maybe know, gets less strong the further north and south you go. An important thing to say is that a lot of people are concerned that exposing themselves to vitamin, sorry, to sunlight uh, will increase the risk of skin cancers, particularly melanoma. Well, actually, small, regular amounts of sunlight, which is what we're talking about here, and I'll explain to you, is actually protective against skin cancers. We're not saying go out and sun worship and get burnt, not at all. Um, but what we are saying is you're aiming for a vitamin D level of 150 to 225 nanomoles per litre, or 60 to 90 nanograms if you're in the US. The way to achieve that is either 15 minutes of sun three to five times a week, but that's in the strong sunlight areas, nearly naked in the sun <laughs> story. So it's perhaps a more realistic uh, approach to say 5,000 to 10,000 units of vitamin D daily. If your levels are very low in your first test, taking a one-off mega dose of say 600,000 units, which sounds incredible, is perfectly safe way to raise your blood levels quickly. It's safe in pregnancy, it's safe in breastfeeding. In fact, any uh, new baby should be receiving vitamin D supplementation until the age of three. So it's perfectly safe. The, the potential is that vitamin D could raise your blood calcium level, and that can be very dangerous. But there's been studies where people have taken just ridiculous doses for four months at a time, and their blood calcium level has never gone up. So it is perfectly safe from that point of view. As I said, the government recommends 400 units a day. You're obviously going to think, well, if I've got to get 150, I need to know what my level is. Can I go to my GP surgery and find out? The answer, unfortunately, normally is no, because it's quite an expensive test for the NHS, and they often say, I'm sorry, we don't have funding for it. But um, there are many, many websites online. BetterU.com is Birmingham, um, one of the Birmingham hospitals, which provides the test very handily at home. I've done it myself for, I think, 28 pounds. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me on that. 20. Is it? Yeah. It's 28, yeah. And it's very quick service. You get results within a week. And then they'll explain to you how much you should take. But just remember 150 to 225. So exercise, step three. Exercise has many positive effects. Most, if not all of you, will have heard that before, I'm sure. It reduces your blood pressure. It reduces your blood cholesterol level. Your risk of infections goes down. It protects you against heart disease and stroke, some cancers, particularly breast and bile. Type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, thinning of the bones, dementia and it reduces your risk of early death by 30%. So it's incredibly important. Regular exercise is as effective as many medications, particularly in cardiovascular disease. The evidence for exercise is far better than all the pills you put on after a heart attack. But in the past, as I said, people with MS were told to avoid it. We now know that MS patients can gain even more benefit than an average person taking a bit of exercise. So in MS specifically, it increases muscle strength, it reduces your fatigue levels, it increases your walking speed, your sexual bile and bladder function, and your overall quality of life. It will half your risk of depression, and it improves your cognitive performance and your ability to problem solve and process information. It stimulates neurons, the nerve cells, and it strengthens the connections between them, those little fingers, so connecting to more nerve cells. It reduces the rate at which your brain shrinks. In MS, brain shrinkage or atrophy is higher than the normal population. It's normal as you age for your brain to shrink slowly, but unfortunately in MS it is slightly higher. It also appears to slow how the disease progresses and it increases two proteins that specifically promote protection of the brain, regenerating damaged and old nerve cells and neuroplasticity, which is a fancy word for reorganizing. So if the train line is really damaged, you go round it and carry on and exercise helps achieve that. And, no surprise, it promotes a TH2 balance. The greatest benefits are seen in those who go from very little activity at all, sedentary lifestyles, to regular, moderate intensity exercise. Moderate intensity, I learned last week, means you can talk, but you couldn't sing. Why would you ever sing <laughs> while you're doing exercise? But you can talk, just about. So if I'm running, uh, I can just about talk, although I would say it's pretty high intensity. Um, Start low and increase slowly. There is no point in going hammer and tongs at something that is completely unrealistic, unachievable, could do you more damage. And some people with MS find that resistance training, which would be, for example, uh, weights or uh, sometimes Pilates or yoga, provokes less symptoms than endurance training, which would be typically running and cycling, where your body temperature rises. There's a, a phenomenon called Itzhoff's phenomenon where nerve 
impulses are slowed by heat, so you feel worse. So if people are like that, and that's a problem, a really good way of doing fitness endurance training is perhaps swimming, because you're cool as you do it, and your temperature won't rise. Qualified trainers are really invaluable in this sense, and are very good at designing programs that are appropriate for you. I know that from personal experience. It, it was tremendous help to me. OMS recommends 30 minutes of exercise three to five times per week. That's not any higher than the general population is advised, but it's just that it's even more important. So that's why it's part of the program. So meditation and mindfulness. And I know you've heard a lot from Phil about this. There's only a couple of points I want to make. The definition, as John Kabat-Zinn said, is paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and without judgment. And there is huge literature on the connection between the mind and the body um, and how it affects health. Two books written by doctors, Deepak Chopra and Bernie Siegel, are two brilliant books that explain the connection between the mind and the body. These are two very sceptical people. One was a brain surgeon who, who has vast experience in this. We know that stress and major life events can trigger uh, MS relapses and activity because they shift you back to TH1. And the body's programmed to respond to stress with fight or flight. In the cave, when you saw a saber-toothed tiger, you increase your adrenaline, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, blood shifts from your brain to your muscles because you're going to have to use them to run away. And the body turns on inflammation because it thinks, hold on, if this tiger is going to bite my arm off, I need to be able to stop bleeding, make my blood sticky to stop bleeding, and I'm going to need to repair. And that's perfectly normal, you need that. But on the long term, chronic stress, you do not want all of this turned on. And that's where meditation fits in. It shifts your immune balance to TH2. And I love this slide, because I didn't understand it at all until I saw it. Meditation literally slows your brain down. Our normal brain, this is, so this is like an EEG, uh, you're showing your brain waves. Beta waves are the normal activity. As you're awake, you're thinking, you're sitting in a room, normal consciousness. As you begin to meditate, and as you relax and go into a meditative state, you change from alpha waves through theta waves and then eventually into delta waves. And you can see that the frequency of the waves and the amplitude of them gets less. Delta waves are absolutely fascinating. It's what you'll typically see when someone is in very, very deep, deep sleep, not dreaming, very deep sleep but it also corresponds to your subconscious mind. And in meditation, really experienced meditators will often be in de the delta wave state during meditation, and that's as restorative as deep, deep sleep. So you can meditate and you're doing all this amazing good for yourself. And also, it's activating your subconscious. So things that perhaps are causing you stress in your life or difficulties will come to the surface. It increases the gray and white matter in the MRI, so it's actually building your brain. Uh, it shrinks the amygdala, which is a little stress emotion center in the brain, and literally you can see MRI scans where after eight weeks of mindfulness, the amygdala has, has uh, shrunk. And it lengthens telomeres, the caps in the end of your DNA. So it makes you younger. It, impro <laughs> it does, technically. Um, it improves your quality of life and it protects against depression, which we know is 50%. And in fact, NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Health Excellence, recommends this now, mindfulness, as a first-line treatment for depression and anxiety because it's as, if not more, effective than tablets. So OMS recommends 30 minutes of meditation daily. Medication. I'm not going to talk to you at length about this. It's a massive subject. Um, I'm doing a separate talk about that this afternoon. But there are a couple of things that I want to make really, really clear. OMS is not against disease-modifying drugs. I think there's a perception, certainly within the medical community, that it's OMS or NHS. You do normal Western medicine, you take your pills and that's what you do, or you go down the alternative route. That is absolutely not the message from OMS. We know that early treatment, is in becoming, the evidence is becoming more and more solid on this, early treatment of MS affects the disease course. But there are many, many issues to consider when you choose a treatment. And you need to address those with your doctor and with your MS nurse or your GP. Because you have to weigh up the benefits that it could reduce relapse rates and uh, disability in the long term versus the risk of potentially incredibly serious side effects. And as a general rule, the more potent it is at treating your MS, the greater the risk of some very serious side effects. 
There are currently 12 disease-modifying drugs uh, licensed to treat relapsing remitting MS in the UK. As I said, the reduced relapse rate and the severity of relapses, and some of them will reduce disease progression. Progressive MS, the secondary and primary forms, currently there is no licensed treatment that alters the disease course there. But nine are under investigation for secondary, and one is about to be released. And seven are being investigated for primary progressive, and two are waiting license there, one hopefully within the next six months. So that's going to be a huge change in the disease. Prevention for family members. So as I said, genetics accounts for a quarter of your risk. You, you cannot change that, unfortunately. Your DNA is your DNA. What you can change, stop smoking. This is incredibly important. It almost doubles your risk of developing the disease. When you do have MS and you continue to smoke, you're four times more likely to develop progressive MS and you do it eight years earlier than someone who doesn't smoke. And passive smoking doubles a child's risk of MS. So vitamin D, and this is for your relatives, this is people who, who aren't affected by MS. Um, low dose frequent sun exposure, or in the winter, 5,000 units. So when I was saying five to 10 for somebody with MS, generally 5,000 for somebody to try and prevent it and you're aiming for a blood level of 100. So 150 to 225 for us, I use the word us for somebody who suffers from MS, sorry. Uh, 100 for somebody who doesn't have it but you're trying to prevent it. And vitamin D for babies should start in pregnancy. If a mum has MS, they will likely be on vitamin D anyway, but it's extra important that the baby is exposed to vitamin D right from conception. The diet, the, no one has studied specifically if the OMS diet can prevent somebody with a family history developing the disease. But in general, we advise a low saturated fat diet, again, supplemented with the 20 mils of flaxseed oil. And as Benjamin Franklin once said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It really is. Preve you want to prevent this disease rather than having to deal with it once you do have it. Just a little bit of brief information about holism as a general. So this is a study of Professor Jelinek in Australia, in Melbourne. 2,519 people with MS in 57 countries who so all around the world started in 2011. It was a mix of those who lived a very healthy lifestyle associated with OMS and those that did not. They then reported themselves in a, a database disease outcomes, lifestyle, medication, these sorts of things. And it's the only independently funded database of lifestyle factors that can modify it in MS, because nearly always they're done by drug companies who are trying to fund a trial of a new drug, so they're not independent, this is. The research has been published um, in numerous medical journals, very, very well thought of ones um, around the world, and there are 15 research <coughs> papers. So what does it tell us? With the seven-step program, 60% relapse rate reduction with flaxseed oil, 42% less chance of disability with a healthy, healthy fat diet, 33% relapse rate reduction on any dose of vitamin D and significant reduction in the risk of depression and fatigue. Part two of holism is ongoing and that's what's going to examine how these changes affect you in the long term, five, ten years down the line after starting the program. Stop MS is another uh, study uh, at the University of Melbourne which looks at people who attended the five-day OMS <coughs> retreats you've maybe heard of. Uh, there are 400 people in that cohort. There's data from one in five years, and it showed, on average, an increased physical and mental health and quality of life of between 15 and 20%. And after one year, marked reductions in relapses, depression, and fatigue. So what you're seeing is people with MS actually improving with time. When you're diagnosed with MS, you're often told, well, it's inevitable downhill decline. And what we're saying here is there's evidence to show that you can improve your quality of life with this program over time. There are no risks. It's not like this diet is mad. You know, you're not just going eating grass and you're not getting the nutrition that you need. It's an incredibly nutritious diet. It's a sound scientific program. There are no risks, there are no side effects. If I offered it to you in the GP surgery as a medicine, a tablet you took, I would certainly take it. It's never too late to start the OMS program, but the earlier you do, the better. You may not see results straight away. On average, it can take between three and five years. 
I've been doing it for two years, I've certainly started to see huge improvements. But the evidence says you will show, you will feel better in time. So to summarize it, you want to eat a plant-based whole food diet plus seafood, daily flaxseed oil. You want to get enough vitamin D, whether through sunlight or by taking supplements of 5,000 to 10,000 units a day. Exercise for 30 minutes three to five times a week. Meditate for 30 minutes daily. Work with your health team and take medication if it's necessary. And try and prevent your family from suffering from the disease. All of the elements are effective. I've shown you numbers for specific parts of the program, but Stop MS shows, the study shows, that together it works best. I want to leave you with one final thought. One year ago, 12 months ago, 98% of the atoms that make up your body, the tiniest building blocks of the body, weren't there because they're turning over all the time. So it's never too late to change it. And that was really handy, I was told to stop. <laughs> that's me, that's Angus, that's Jenny, that's after we ran a 10K in Belfast, and that's the reason I follow OMS. Thank you very much for listening.